Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome to this deep dive into the halls of Ardenvol, or Vol. I'm not sure. I say Ardenvol usually, but I think it's technically Vol. This is a mega dungeon, and one of the, I would say, most impressive mega dungeons that I have ever read. Now, I'm going to be honest right away, guys. Haven't run this game, haven't run this dungeon, and I haven't even read every floor in detail. There, there are too many. This document, this one page, this, this one document is 1,122 pages, 1,122 pages. I have not read this in detail, the whole thing. But I've read many floors in detail, read the overviews of it, and I really, really wanted to talk about it. Even though I haven't run it. Because of the way that my expectations were for this thing, and how they were changed based on how I read it. And just... This is one of the most impressive documents I have ever read in my entire life, in, in terms of an RPG. Uh, and, and I didn't expect it. I totally didn't expect it. So, The Halls of Ardenvol is, a, as I said, it's a mega dungeon. Now, I'm going to quickly go over to another document, because this, this file, when you buy it, you can either, of course, you can get them all in physical form, or you can get the PDFs. I have only the PDFs of them. But the map book gives you a really good overview of what you're going to be getting here. Here's the world, uh, and then a close-up of the valley, where the game, where the uh, Mega Dungeon is located. You can see Ardenvol at the very top. It's a hex crawl. And then down you have the player's version of that map. You get the starting town, the Azure Keep and Gosterwick. Ardenvol, which is the cliff face. There's a switchback road that goes up hundreds of feet, almost. Well, what is that? Almost... Uh, 15,000, 1,500, excuse me, 1,500 feet, just about almost, from the valley floor. There's a waterfall, and you can see the ruins at the very top. It's a great image. These are all uh, locations you can run into, and then some of them are entrances into Ardenvol itself. Then you get a map of the upper level, the ruined city at the very top, with a bunch of adventure locations and things going on here, and a lot of entrances down into the dungeon. The main entrance, which is sort of the Pyramid of Toth, one of the dungeons up top, the Tower of Scrutiny, and then the side view of the dungeon with all the sublevels going all the way down. So I'm going to pause here on this sublevel map and talk a little bit about what Ardenvol is. Ardenvol is the most interesting mega dungeon I've ever read. It's the most engaging mega dungeon I've ever read. Now, a lot of this is from the GM's perspective. I'm going to explain more what I mean later. The writing gives the GM a lot, and it's engaging, it's, it's flavorful, but, and this is perhaps one of the downsides of it, that stuff is often only interesting, the stuff that it gives you is only interesting, or is especially interesting to Dungeon Masters, to GMs, and a very particular type of player. Most players are not going to find a lot of the really extra details of this dungeon, terribly interesting. Now I'm going to talk about, well, at least in my experience, um, that's, that's the case. But I'll talk more about what, what, that, what that is as we go into it. Now, first of all, why Mega Dungeon? Right, why Mega Dungeon? <laughs> well, what's the point of doing one massive dungeon when you can do a bunch of individual dungeons and that have them be more tailored to your players, have them be more distinct so that you have variety, so you play in one for a while, and then you play a new campaign, and it's a new place, and all that stuff. And there's certainly an argument to be made for that, and certain tables are going to prefer that. They wouldn't want to go into one dungeon. But there's something to be said for, over the course of time, digging into a place. And realizing that that place is bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and goes on and on and on. There's a difference between having... Well, as the book describes in its uh, introduction, one of the editor introductions... Ardenvol is like the first meal. When you first play your first session there, it's, it's, a, it's a great meal. And then you realize it's only the first course of a 90-course meal. And that's a certain sort of overwhelming awe that comes from that. That's different than saying, I'm going to eat 90 meals over the next, you know, <laughs> whatever that be, 30 days. Right? There's a difference. Even though it's the same overall amount, you might say, there's a difference in the sort of woe that you feel. Now, the one probably would be considered a bit of gluttony, right? <laughs> but there is a certain level of gluttony to Ardenvol. If you were to, as a DM, say, 
or a GM say, we're going to run this thing from beginning to end. Guys, I'm, I'm, this is my new thing. That would be gluttony. That would be an overreach. That's not how I think most tables are going to approach this product. First of all, most GMs aren't going to buy this thing because without a sale, it's like $100 plus dollars in PDF, like $120 or something in PDF. And in physical form, most people are not going to buy it. But if you can get it on a sale, I highly recommend it. But, but even so, most people aren't going to buy it. And then, of those who buy this Mega Dungeon, a handful are going to read through the whole thing. I mean, relatively a handful, right? And then, of those who have read through the whole thing, an even smaller percentage is going to say, I'm going to run it. I'm going to run the whole thing. Now, like any good huge dungeon, this is definitely modular. You can take out these sections and put them individually as a dungeon in your game. That would be easy enough. You could even take out whole rooms or factions or characters, magic items, ideas, and just mine this thing for ideas because it's 1,122 pages. So there are just hundreds of great ideas in here. Thousands of great ideas in here that you could steal for your game. So in, in, in terms of like mining uh, resources, this is a very valuable PDF. So okay, that's, that's one thing, or a very valuable resource, that's one thing. But going back to that idea of, of, you know, fewer and fewer people are actually going to be the target audience of the people who are going to run this whole thing, or are going to try to run this whole thing. So, you know, that's, that's just being said. Most of us are not going to ever play Ardenvol all the way through. I, I would say of the people who play Ardenvol, no one, I would venture to say, not a single person who runs this game is ever going to show their players every single thing that they could find here. Every secret door, every sub-level, every magic item hidden behind a puzzle, every NPC, every bit of lore, not a single table is going to do it. Because there is so much. Not only is there so much, but there are places in this book, and I'll talk about it more as we go to it, where it, where it explicitly says the GM should add or could add more here. Develop your own idea. So, even though this is 1,122 pages with... What is it, 10 levels and 12 sub-levels, 13 sub-levels? Even though it's all that, there's still more that could be added and there's opportunity to add more. Not that you'd ever need to, but you could. So, it is a, an embarrassment. It's not, it's not an embarrassment of riches, that, that comes too short. This is a dragon's hoard of riches. But the problem with a dragon's hoard is that there's so much there you can't get the individual pieces, right? You just gather it all up in big bags and bring it back to town. Um, the dragon has to spend how much time on his hoard admiring each piece, right? Centuries admiring each piece. And I think that is definitely how the GM who buys this is gonna have to approach it to some degree. You're gonna buy it and you're gonna admire each piece for a while before you decide to use it because it will take some time to work this thing. Okay, now, uh, let's go down a bit into the main PDF. The art in this book is great. One of the things that's very clear about this book, and it's one of the reasons why I will admit my first impression was negative, was that it doesn't take itself seriously, but it recognizes that it's a big deal. It recognizes that it's a really unique product. And that's not something that, I mean, it, 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 when I first read it, I was like, mm, that's kind of full of itself. I'm just talking about it like it's this really rare, really interesting, really crazy thing that you're just going to never run out of. And Okay. But it's true. It's all true. Like, as I read through it, I was like, wow, this is actually really unique. This is actually incredible. You know, any work that has, what, an author's foreword, a cartographer's foreword, a publisher's foreword, um, three forewords, right? You're like, wow, this thing is, this thing is, uh, well, yeah, my first impression, it's full of itself. But man, I was wrong. There's a difference between being proud, like prideful <laughs> and arrogant, and being honest. And man, this book is honest. It is, it is impressive. It's huge. It's one of the rare products out there that, at least as far as I can tell, is both big and interesting. The dungeon levels that I read through, and granted, as I said, I did not read through all of them in detail. I don't know every room of every floor. I know a lot of them, but I don't know every room of every floor. The stuff I read through was almost always interesting. Every room 
had something, or almost every room, had something of interest there. Something that the players would find fun. Now, there were a number of empty rooms, but they're actually pretty rare, and they're placed well. You need an empty room to rest. You need a place just to have a breather, right? Every room can't be full of stuff. But to compare this dungeon to, I don't know, the other mega dungeons that I've seen, you know, the, the, which, granted, I haven't seen all that many, if we look at, say, like, Greg Gillespie's mega dungeons, Barrow Maze, uh, Forbidden Caverns of Archaea, those are really cool and really interesting, and there's a lot of really cool rooms. And then there's a lot of vanilla rooms, a lot of rooms where just nothing really interesting is very much happening. I'll be honest, I, I didn't find many of those here. Where it's like, oh, it's another room that's just like that past room. That, that didn't happen. Almost every room was different and interesting, unique. And that's incredible to say for a document that is 1,000... 122 pages. I just... You know, I'm kind of blown away. So, you get the place itself. And I have to say this too, the world building is really good. And that's one of the things that this book does really well and why GMs, I think, will really, really love reading it. If you're into world building, if you're into good writing. But, it's one of those things that I think... Hmm, how to put this? It might be one of the dis connect between the GM and the players of this game. Now, I think there will be players who really, really like discovering the world building, discovering the history, discovering the, the past of Ardenvolt. But that is going to be one of the things that drives a lot of the flavor here, is discovering the past here. There's a lot of past stuff going on. Um, I'll talk about it more in detail when I cover one of the floors. Uh, the Halls of Toth, which is uh, level 3. Well, level 2, the Howling Caves, and and level 3, the, the Halls of Toth. I think those two, well, they, they really show forth this idea, what I'm saying. Okay, so let's go into, again, look at the art. The art in this book is great too, and it's one of the things that really helps to sell it. As you're reading through it, you're like going through pages of text, paragraphs of text, reading through some room descriptions, reading through treasure, and then you'll turn the page and it'll be a full piece art. Great piece of art. Old school art. Whoa. That really sets the tone. And Ardenvol is kind of an interesting mix of Egyptian, Byzantine, traditional Anglo-Saxon fantasy, all blended together with other influences too. Now, one thing right off the bat, this book has sci-fi elements. Significant sci-fi elements as you go down through the dungeon. The past involves aliens crashing into the planet. Now, there is an, an expanded section, an extended section on how to make those sci-fi elements fantasy, if you don't like a sci-fi flavor. So there's a section in this book that says, hey, here's how you make it into a, um, a fantasy, straight up, if you don't want any sci-fi. I don't mind a little bit of sci-fi in my fantasy. Actually, I don't even mind a lot of it. But I know some people are just like a dead no. Well, if that's the case, you still can run this, or you still can draw from it. You just make those changes that it suggests. So the general introduction with a brief history of Ardenville. Now, this is, as I said, one of the things that this dungeon has going for it. It's going to make a lot of GMs love it, and that's this deep sense of history. The entire dungeon is full of history. Every room, or not every room, but a lot of rooms, have been very carefully constructed to reveal something about the past or the way that things have changed or to make that change apparent to you. So, you know, there will be a ruined... Um, a description of the ruined room next to a very more modern construction. And the juxtaposition of the ancient and the modern construction is made explicit and apparent to the GM and to the attentive player. So that you can say, okay, in this part of the dungeon it's older, uh, that means we might run into these sorts of things. This part of the dungeon is newer, we might run into these sorts of things here. Or this age. Okay, so this is the middle period when these things were happening. That means this is the sort of stuff we can encounter there. If we're looking for this kind of stuff, we can go into that portion of the dungeon. But that stuff really has to be gathered. Now, for the GM, it's it's all laid out. Uh, it's told, this room, this is what the room was, this is how it's aged, this is how it looks. You can describe some of that to your players, but unless they're very attentive or very interested in picking up the history of Ardenvol then they're not going to get a lot of that 
benefit because the dungeon is very carefully laid out so that this period again will result in these sorts of perils and this period will this 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 age will sort of result in those sorts of perils and and to to know the difference to learn the history of Ardenville players will be really really rewarded there's a lot of a lot of puzzles that can only be solved if you know the litany of Toth, for example, right? If you know the, uh, the the ancient prayer of the old priesthood that's been that's been lost here, or if you interact with this ghost or this and undead creature in this way, and you realize that it's the survivor or it's not the, you know, the undead version of of this adventurer who came down with a party of three, and the other two are other elsewhere, and you can help and deal with them even more easily if you discover that there's a connection or. There are lots of things that involve the history and the plots of things that happened a thousand years ago in the dungeon. It's an old place. It's a very old place. So, if you don't have players that are interested in learning the age of a thing, in learning the backstory of a thing, if they're only interested in treasure, if they're only interested in monsters, if they're only interested in that, then a lot of the value of this dungeon is going to be lost. So, either... You kind of have to have a group of players who are interested in learning the lore, the world, the connections. Or, you're going to want to encourage your players to maybe pick that up as a side habit. <laughs> because if you're going to play this, so much cool stuff will be just left aside and lost. So much of that flavor and tone and sense of grandeur will be lost if you don't emphasize the age, the distinct periods, and if you don't get to know the distinct periods of the dungeon, and or if the players don't do that either. So keep that in mind. If you're not a GM who really likes deep lore, deep time, right, this idea of a thousand years of history having passed and things happening in between, and this faction coming from this 200-year period and that faction coming from this 50-year period where this thing happened and... <laughs> But you read through the introduction of the history and there's a lot of things going on in this place. So there's a timeline from, a, and I, I like how it, how it works, it, it starts from the present and goes back in the Archontian Reckoning, the world of Archontos, which is the world here. Approximate years in the past, the important event and how it goes. Go all the way back. The dungeon is very, very impressive. Essentially, it's a place that was created by, well, many people. There are things that have come up from under the earth that have hollowed out tunnels and made it a place. There are literally aliens who have crashed into the planet and ruled it for a time, and then they were overthrown by their own creations. These sort of, well, trolls, basically, but the, these things they had created uh, under the earth, and this goes back and forth. And then the Archontians show up, they're humans, and they're ru ruling, and they take over, and they worship Toth, and then there's another god, Set, that's evil, I think, basically. <laughs> and Set and Toth have these competitions, and these, and, and this all happens, and then the Empire starts to fall, and uh, the Empire does fall in a climactic way, and the city is destroyed in a climactic way, and then time passes, and things resettle in, and things start to spread out, and then the Archontean Empire comes back and tries to resettle it, and then they lose, they fail... And then now there's sort of a re-emergence of the people, of the humans, back to this place. Um, and they're, they're kind of coming back in and they're starting to settle in the valley. And so you get a movement of civilization, destruction, civilization, destruction, civilization, destruction. And so as a result, the lowest levels are kind of built from the bottom up with these other places that have been modified over time, and then the stuff at the top is human, so it's been built down. And so again, and then you have it where they meet and where things have been adapted and changed, and so you really have this entire very complicated thing. The really cool section here on design principles. I love this when designers, game masters, uh, cartographers, whatever, explain why they did what they did. That's really, really cool. There are some very important principles that are used here. Scale is one of the things. Large, right? Four principles, he says. Scale is one. Coherence is another. 
coherence is a very important part of this dungeon, that it has to make sense, or at least the sort of sense that you can hope for in a big mega dungeon. Right, that there have to be a sort of idea of how this could exist next to that. How this trap, this puzzle, could have come to be in a way that isn't totally arbitrary. How these creatures could still be around after this amount of time. I'll give you one example. In uh, one of the dungeon levels, dungeon level 2, there is a section where there are a bunch of, set, you know, basically giant apes. They've taken over a section of caves. And they drink from a pool that's just in the, wa in the ground. There's just a pool of water there. And you think, well, where is it being fed from? How is this pool of water here? Well, it turns out there's a, a, an, an invisible decanter of endless water that is just plopped at the bottom of that pool. And it's been pouring out water, and the apes have been drinking it at a certain rate, and so the pool is of a certain size. And the, it, because it's invisible, it's been invisibility has been cast on it. The apes don't know about it, and so they've just had this unlimited source of water for their entire time. Well, if you dive down and take the decanter of endless water, well, then it'll dry up, and suddenly the apes won't have their water source, and it says, and then they'll they'll, they'll leap because they won't have enough water to support themselves in this dungeon. So they'll they'll scatter and spread throughout the rest of the dungeon looking for water, and, and you'll have dealt with them that way. Or if you kill the apes. Well, then they're not drinking the water anymore. So then it starts to spread. The decanter, the, the water starts to fill and flood and spill, and then it becomes a little waterfall, a very small waterfall, <laughs> down into the dungeon proper. Little things like that, where it makes sense, and you look at these creatures, and you say, well, they have to have water. They can't survive without water. Well, how would they have it? Well, they have this. Okay, well, why do they have a little pool of water here? Okay, well, let's say there's a magic... I mean, it's, it's sort of one of those things where the design has probably been looked at where, you know, from from the need to the cause, rather than let's have an encanter of endless water and see what would happen as a result. But it makes sense. It's coherent. It fits with the world, and it fits with also the sort of fantastical logic that you have in D&D and Mega Dungeons and RPGs. So, coherence. The third principle is that it is supposed to be, and it often is, I think very often is, a loving homage, homage to the tropes of old-school gaming. Right, so this is an old-school Mega Dungeon. But it isn't slavishly old-school. There are instant death traps. And there are death traps that will kill you quick. And there are things that are really awful. And you can get in over your head really easily. There are tons of old-school monsters. There are owlbears down here, right? Uh, there are great tropes from the old-school uh, design of games. But it isn't entirely old school. It isn't entirely, again, slavish in a lot of ways to the design of those old games. And the last guiding principle is that the hall should offer the opportunity for plenty of role-playing, or for styles of role-playing. This is why I think this dungeon is so good. Every single level, there is stuff to interact with, stuff to kill, stuff to sneak by, stuff to manipulate. It is, it is, it is often designed very openly in terms of like the, the, the direction you have to go. You often are dropped into like a middle, like a, the middle of a wheel, right? And then you can go out in any of the direction of the spokes, basically, where you have lots of choices in, in terms of where to go. Not only in terms of horizontal, but vertical. You can go down very far. You can skip entire levels of the dungeon. You can find shortcuts, and you can do... So there's lots of verticality, lots of horizontal choice. But within those places, it's not, okay, here's another dungeon to fight, or here's another monster to fight, here's another monster to fight, here's another monster to fight. There are factions, important NPCs on every level, that have their own motivations and that can be turned on each other or that maybe are already fighting, and that therefore you can take advantage of that if you discover it. Lots of things like that throughout this dungeon. So... In terms of design, it would be so easy for a 1,122-page document. It would be so easy to just lay out fight after fight after fight. You know, new sort of graffiti-covered walls that have a little bit of treasure after you fight some more giant rats. And the creatures get harder as you go down. 
And, and that's really what we often see in a lot of Mega Dungeons, or at least I would say in more amateurish Mega Dungeons or, or attempts to, to do this. This is certainly what my temptation would be. If I were designing a Mega Dungeon, I'd be like, man, this is really complicated. I'll put like really big level factions, like maybe like the entire floor is controlled by one faction or something like that. That wouldn't be good design, but that's what I would probably do. Um, but that's not what these designers have done. Just really cool. Really, really, really cool. Okay, so the four principles are held to. Scale, coherence, uh, old school, and opportunity for different styles of role-playing. Variety, maybe is another way of putting that. Absolutely. Okay, now there's a breakdown of what level the PCs will probably should be on the different levels of the dungeon, and as you can see, it ranges from 1 to 9. So we're not talking about a very, very, very high, high level mega dungeon. What that means, of course, is that while there are areas that are certainly much more difficult than others, certainly much more difficult than others, you can get in over your head anywhere, and you can kind of survive almost anywhere. And the places that are very hard to survive in tend to be very hard to get into. They're sub-levels that are hidden quite well, or they're things that require lots and lots of creativity on the part of the players, so that when the players get into it, they're like, hey, we, you know, they get the sense that they've skipped stuff or that they've been very clever or gotten into something that maybe isn't easy to get into and therefore maybe won't be easy to get out of. That's, I'm, I'm totally okay with difficulty spikes if, if the players themselves skip stuff and know that they've skipped stuff or maneuver their way into something that's very difficult to get into. Then I think I'm, I'm, de I'm definitely okay with the players getting in way over their head. Because one of the things this dungeon does well, as far as I can tell, as far as I've seen, is it telegraphs more difficult places quite well. Now, one thing you see about this uh, section here, general construction features, is that because the dungeon has been built up and down and out by lots of different cultures and races, the designs of each of these sections of the dungeon are different. And so, as you describe the different regions, you're going to describe them differently. They're going to be different construction. And the players can become aware of that and take advantage of that if they start to learn connections between the ki kinds of treasure they can find, the kinds of puzzles they might face, the kinds of dangers and traps they might run into, what sort of lore they need to know, how they need to prepare, based on the kind of dungeon, the, the section of dungeon they're entering into. That means you as a GM kind of have to learn them. And you kind of have to learn them really well or you have to have them, you know, ready ahead of time. Because the Haketi sections, or the Haketi sections, are different than the Rudishva sections. And those are different than the Varumani sections. And those are different than the Arkantian sections. And those are different than the Kiliani sections. Now, what's cool is that each of those locations are keyed here. And so you can briefly check if you're gonna be running something for an, an area that night. You can come to this section and say, okay, now, I'm, they're going to be in these rooms, this area. Okay, so that means it's mostly going to be, you know, Arcantia. But maybe there's a little bit of something else there. And these, these three rooms in that area are from that other design. So, okay, I'll remember that, or maybe I'll mark it down. If you're going to play that way. You don't have to do that, but as I said before, you'll lose a lot of the connections, a lot of the puzzles, a lot of the deep lore, and, and, and part of the value of this dungeon is that it is, it is so coherent and it is so, well, seeped in lore, steeped in lore, that if you don't do that sort of thing, if you don't look at the kind of construction that you're talking about, then you're going to really miss out. You're really going to miss out. Now there are some iconic locations here that are really big, like really cool, um, that that would be worth noting, right? Uh, things that people might be talking about. And then there's the scuttlebutt about it, each of them. So you can go through and read these and then if the like you could build an entire adventure right you don't have to build this game off of here is here are the entrances go you could instead be like okay you your your players you the adventure is you've been told to find the court of the goblin king right and then they could start off with this scuttlebutt a rumor and then they have to find their way down or you could say that you know someone's been lost down in the great cavern and it's up to them to find it or they, they have been hired to find the Forge of Jorak. In other words, the game gives you information on different, uh, different approaches, different avenues 
of approach to this dungeon. With particular regions, as we'll see with particular rumors, with particular floors, with factions, with NPCs, it gives you all that information and says, you can approach this however you want, you and your players. So you could say, here is just, here are maps. Go for it. Here are NPCs, or an NPC you're supposed to find. Go for it. Here's somebody who went missing. Find them. Here is a location that you've heard rumors about. Here is a treasure that you've been hired to find, or that have, have a map to, or something like that. This is a this is just a region. This is a campaign primer, rather than a particular adventure. Because again, this is a 1,122 pages of dungeon. It's a world that it's giving you. How you approach that world is going to be up to you. But if you book, if you if you get this book with the assumption that it's going to say, okay, here's a, the adventure, then you're going to be sorely mistaken. You're going to be very disappointed. That's not what this is. This is a this is a this is a region. This is a world. Now there are two, well, as you'll see, D100 tables for rumors. Really, really, really cool. There are adventuring rumors and historical rumors. Mostly, these are true rumors, but, and I've talked about this before, I don't like false rumors that they're just false straight up. But what's cool about this is that even the false rumors usually, now there are some exceptions, but even the false rumors tell you something about the dungeon, or they get you close to the truth, or they, they indicate what the truth might be. That's really cool. So again, even when you have a false rumor, there is a reason why it might be there, and it might tell you something about the dungeon. Now, not every time. Sometimes they're false, and you're like, that's just not helpful. That's not helpful. That's just a lie. But usually, when those ones are presented, there's something going on there. Or at least there's a half-truth. Yeah, not every time, but much of the time. Now look at the, the these rumors. These aren't little one-line rumors. Another thing that is cool about these rumors is that for the most part, they are gameable. They are things that involve either NPCs or locations or treasure or monsters. They're not just something about the history, at least in the adventuring ones. Now you'll come to the history ones. But even these are, for the most part, gameable. They're rumors about things you might want to investigate. Things you might uh, want to know about the dungeon. Rumors about purposes of things that might, that might relate to why you would go somewhere or not. Not always, again, not always. Not every, not every rumor is a home run, but many of them are. And you can see that there are tons and tons and tons and tons of them. 200 rumors. Now there's a breakdown of the factions of Ardenvolt. It's a dynamic place, and that's absolutely true. It's a dynamic place. You get the basic rundown of the relationships between them. Many of them are unknown to each other. Not all of them, but again, many of them are unknown to each other. And so when you... Uh, this isn't like every faction is involved on every floor or knows everybody, but there's usually a couple factions on every floor that are very involved, and then there are a handful of touchstones to other factions. Incursions, minor incursions, or references to, or, or maybe one, one representative of a faction on a floor that connects to other floors. So not every dungeon is just like, it's not, it's not like it's just multiple levels of the same dungeon. You kind of have self-contained areas with bleed over at the, at the borders. And then sometimes it's much more, you know, vertical, sometimes it's much more connected where there's really, there really is a, 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 you know, a, a connection between the two levels. But you get lots and lots of factions, and you can go through each of the individual ones. And again, some of these are what we are much more kind of normal in one way, but uh, but others are much more unique and, and really interesting. I think. Now, when it comes to some of the new creatures that you're looking at, you're gonna have to look at the back of the book to see the descriptions for them, because they're not. It's not obvious from the description of the faction what it is. If it's human, if it's not human. You have to remember the terms and the creatures and, and what they are, because again, they're unique to this system. So you have to know, you have to make that connection. Sometimes it's clear the beast men, right? For example, uh, the goblin king, uh, the halfling gang, but, but sometimes it's not. 
So you really have to go through and, and figure those out. But these are just pages and pages and pages of factions. And again, it's like, it's like building a world. Of course, you'd have tons of factions in a world. Well, the same thing is true here. You have to think of it that way. You're looking at a world, not a, not just a big dungeon. A great piece of art there. And going on and on and on. Adventure hooks. These are particular adventure hooks. Um, and there are less developed hooks listed under each faction in the Factions of Ardenbold chapter. And there's also rumors that you could use that would basically be some sort of faction. So uh, you've got adventure hooks lots of different ways. But then you have some particular ones. The Abducted Cannon, the Missing Regalia, uh, Penetrate the Opolis of Obsidian Gates, Infiltrate or Eliminate the Cult of Set, Locate and or Apprehend Kerbor Khan, Stop the Poison Supply, Find the Rogue Druid, Cleanse the Ziggurat, The Mystery of the Beacon, Tracking the Eighth Collegium, The Tomb of the Twins, or Rescue Operation. And this is just generic. Here are all the people that have been captured in the dungeon and are being held at different levels that you can rescue and where they are and who would be interested in their rescue. Or you can come up with it on your own if they don't have anyone particularly. The Oldest Profession, or Tomb Rounding 101. Tombs within Ardenvol, particular tombs, right? And who the Guardians are, uh, and whether they're trapped or not, and what kind of treasure is within, so that if you want to generate, at a glance, an adventure, you can know the general kind of creature you're going to be fighting, right? If you go for uh, Tualika, or Tualicha, well, the Guardian is a mummy. So that's pretty hard. You're probably, and it's got major treasure, but it's, it's trapped by a mummy. You're probably not going to throw a first level party at that one. But you might throw the third level party at that one, or a second level party at that one. Right, and it shows you where they are in the entire place. So I really like this. I really, really like this. And then customizing Ardenville. Where could you add some more places? Possible expansion ideas. Well, maybe there's a wizard's laboratory with tricks and defenses located behind the Colossus of Vol. That's one of the first things you can see. Uh, there are also some teleportation gates in this dungeon. There are places that go to the City of Brass, the Abyss, the Ethereal Plane, uh, the Astral Plane, a sub-basement of the Imperial Palace of Arkantos, <laughs> right, the City of Arkantos, the Free City of Dungeal on O'Earth, or Dun Eagle, Dun Eagle, yeah. Great Hawk, get it? Dun Eagle, Great Hawk. Um, a cave in the Snowy Mountains, many miles north of Arden Vol. The sultry sky is above the ruined city of Agorian, located off the coasts of Australios. See World of Arcontis. Really cool stuff. So if you want to have that, portals and have them go beyond the dungeon itself, you have places they can go and where those locations are. And then flavor, sci-fi and fantasy. How to change the two um, if you want to add, if you want to take out the sci-fi elements and make it just straight up fantasy. Now, external region. Burdox Valley, the Azure Keep, and Gosterwick. The valley is really cool. I have to say that while the focus of this book obviously is the dungeon for most of its length, if this were just the valley itself with the conflicts here, the NPCs here, the factions here, you would have a great setting. I would, I would run this just on its own. It's so well developed and the ideas are so great. This could just be its own setting. Like this is this is fantastic. You get a, a, a map key with a whole bunch of locations, a bunch of villages, towns, and fortifications. So different levels of administration and, and, and um, power and things that the PCs can interact with. You've got different water courses, woods, named hills, parks, uh, or sorry, hills, ridges, and rock projections, marshes, swamps, lakes, and adventure sites. Now, obviously, Arden Bowl is the big one. But you've got the bandit camp, the ibis's roost, the thicket, the lost shrine, and then a whole bunch of like hints and perhaps dungeons or adventure sites in the different location descriptions as you go through. You could run not just a, a mega dungeon campaign here. You could run a hex crawl or a region crawl in this area because it's it's small enough that it's compact and everything's connected in some way, but it's big enough that there are independent factions and creatures and monsters and things to explore. This is absolutely fantastic. You've got a couple of factions, especially one I like a lot, which is the Knights of the Azure Shield. They're a little mysterious. You have to find out more about them in the dungeon itself, what they're doing. And the culture that is developed here, the Archontian culture, is really cool. It's, again, Byzantine, 
with mixes of other stuff too. And that's not something that I'm used to in my fantasy. So I like it a lot. Now it's it's in one sense it's pretty it's pretty well old school. There are trainers. There's like an assassins guild with a, a trainer for the assassins. <laughs> there's a thieves guild, which you know how well it, it's perfect and necessary for an adventure for a campaign like this. In that it, you know it fits within the what do you want to say? It fits within the the logic of the RPG. Right, the logic of an RPG, the logic of a of a game world, rather than a, the real world, and and that's the whole thing, right? You have to take this with a certain level of this is a game, and then all of this stuff falls into place and makes sense. The place itself is is manageable, but there's enough here, enough world building, you might say, enough, enough lore, and enough flavor in the world to make this place feel real within the context of that game world. And that's what I really like. And so also there's some really cool conflicts out here. There's a really cool NPCs and personalities and secrets and things to find and deal with. And again, I could see a certain kind of player getting caught up in the politics of these people outside the dungeon and not really going into the dungeon. Now there's a side view, an art view of the cliff into which the long stair is built. And at the top of that, you get uh, Ardenville. And then you get description of the place. Now, again, the, the approach, the long stair itself, is really cool. And the, this is where we start to get into, well, well, I will start to get into something that is hard about this dungeon. And that is the, the quantity of writing for the rooms and the things that you're looking at. There often are paragraphs of text for the rooms. This is old school in its, well, it's classic in its format. It's not OSR in its bullet pointing in its preci precision, its agility of writing. This is old school. Now the writing is good. It's not um, for the old school. It's not overly wordy, but it is, it is like important stuff is, you know, halfway through the first paragraph or, or in the middle of the second paragraph or something like that sometimes in these rooms and in these descriptions. And that's just not always going to be everyone's preference. To run this out of the book, I would say is almost impossible. If you just pick it up and you're like, I'm going to run Arden Vol tonight. No way, man. No way. At least as far as I'm concerned, there's no way. You have to do work and prep and condense and figure out and bullet point. Like You'd have to write up and prepare to run this. It's not my preference. I prefer to run stuff that I can either improvise on or, or read through once very quickly and then run... But I'll give it this, uh, this credit. <laughs> Reading through each of the dungeon floors once, I was very prepared, I would say, I would be very prepared to run it with a quick checkup before each session. Like, the, the, the writing is clear, the descriptions are, there's not a whole lot of very, very complex things going on, such that you're, you're just going to have to review it every time. But... There are particular, like for example, we'll get to it when we get to it, but there are random encounter tables, not just for floors, but for parts of the floors. That this portion from this room to that room has its own random encounter table and its own random encounter check time. And this room to that room has its own random encounter check time. And the, the, the tables that you're rolling on for each of those random encounter sections are different. That's the sort of stuff you kind of have to get used to. You can't at a glance, remember, at least I don't, at a glance, see that, remember it, and know what I'm rolling on. I have to have the tables in front of me, I have to look through, and another thing is you really have to have the maps. You have to jump back and forth between the maps. So I'll go back up to the long stair, because this is what we're looking at now. Like, again, it, you really have to jump back and forth. If you were, if you were going to play this at a, with a printed copy, you'd have different volumes, and you'd have to have multiple ones out at, at the same time, or print things out, or write down points and bullet points. Like, this is going to take... Uh, prep. This is going to take work. This is going to be... You're going to have to do your own homework to run this game. Because you're, you're not just going to open up one PDF file, at least in, in, as far as I can tell, having not run it. You're not going to open up one PDF file and jump back and forth to the things you need. Now, for one, one criticism I have of the PDF itself is that... And this would be a lot of work, so it's a criticism that I recognize is asking a lot. But there's no hyperlinks in the PDF. And it would be really, really, really cool for someone to go through 
and hyperlink the locations that you have on in this document. It would be an entire project. I mean, it would be a, a lot of work. But the ease that that would give to a DM or a GM to run this would be so worthwhile. So, you know, what can you do? It, that's a lot of work. But man, I would be so grateful if the creators or someone would go through and hyperlink, uh, link the different parts of the book to the other parts, the PDF at least. Because that would make this so much easier to run. Even if you just did it for the rooms, that would be great. Now, as I said, the writing is paragraph text. Uh, there are important bits of information that are hidden. There is bullet pointing, or I shouldn't say it's bullet pointing. There is bolding, and there are things that are underlined that are special, sometimes traps or special features are underlined at the end of the paragraph. There are italicized things, if it's books or magic items, or I think books mostly. Um, there will be um, parenthetical text that will lead you to different locations, but it's all a lot of text. As I said, you're reading, you're reading, you're reading. This is 1,122 pages of reading. You've got to be comfortable with that. It's not going to be easy to get into. It's not going to be a breeze. You're going to have to work. I think it's worth the effort. I really do. And again, the writing is good. You read through it once, you get it. It's not, there's not, it's not bad writing. It's very good, in fact. But it's of that style that's very long and, you know, classic. <laughs> classic style. And I would say less agile. I think that's the, the phrase that I have adapted now when I'm describing the older style of design. The ideas here are excellent. Absolutely excellent. When you get to the ruined city especially, once again, you could spend, without even building the mega dungeon below, just having a few minor dungeons on the surface, a place to explore. There's so many cool ideas here. So many cool ideas here. If I jump to the map of Ardenvol, you've got these... Um, You've got a, a, an awakened tree, you've got apes, you've got a dragon, you've got a, a, a swamp that's formed because the lake is kind of, um, no, the dam is no longer functioning properly, and you can drain it, and you or you can expand it, and so you can make the swamp much bigger, or you can drain away the water, and there's stuff to explore if you do, and you can make the dragon angry if you do either of those things. There is a, an inn in 22, a tavern, where the people there are not as nice as they first appear, but there's actually factions even there, people who are keeping secrets from each other. There are dungeons to explore on the surface, there are dungeons to the left and right, there are optional dungeons that the book says you could add in. There are puzzles that are long-term puzzles, you gather all the pieces of this um, statue and put them together, but you have to kind of explore the whole place and risk some very dangerous things in order to do it. You get a major boon. Uh, there are I mean, just, again, so many things going on in Ardenvol, just the city level, which is just the connections to all the different dungeon levels. Now, here's a, would be a great example of a place, as you can see, where, man, it would be so good if it was hyperlinked. So you could say, oh, they're going in AB39. Great. Well, I'm going to click on uh, level four, and it takes you right to that map. It doesn't do that. You have to scroll down. Not the end of the world, but it would be nice to have that sort of thing for ease of use in running the, the, the PDF. I feel like in the writing, in the construction, a lot of effort has been made to make it as clear as possible for the kind of product it is, but there are other quality of life, ease of use features that could have been added to make it a little bit easier to run. Ardenvol as a city is awesome. As a place to explore, just the ruined city itself, awesome to explore. So many cool encounters, so many cool locations, and, and when I say cool encounters and locations, I mean things that are full of flavor, things that are full of the lore and the world building, but, for example, if you search the ruins, there's a d20 table for the type of discovery you can have. And if you, 1 through 4, it's an inscription. See table 2 below. It's a d20 table for your sample inscription, your form, the form of the inscription, where you find it, what the inscription itself is, and what it refers to with GM notes to sample inscriptions. That's so cool. So, for example, if you roll a 9 or a 10, you get a fragment of a picture vase. And you could roll three times or just read straight across. The sample inscription is Alexandros, servant of the mighty lord who helped tame the great cavern and cultivate the spores. And then the note on that is, well, Alexandros is an otherwise forgotten agent of Tarmus, the great Thorian, uh, Thothian priest, excuse me, who brought the great cavern areas 3, 163, and 3, 172 under Archontian control. Also refers to the fungal forester, Sinu monsters, who inhabit these those caverns. So you have... A reference to something going on below that builds up player expectations. Ooh, a great cavern and spores? 
Maybe we should go look at that. Is it absolutely essential to understand any particular puzzle? No, but it gives you a sense of this place. The player is a sense of the place. And if they're paying attention, if they remember it, they write it down. If they follow up, they can be really rewarded. And this, this, this is the sort of thing I mean for the entire place. You have bits of lore, bits of world building that might not pay off for like 10 levels. I mean, physically and in terms of experience. They might, like It references to things that are way down at the bottom or things that uh, references to things that you might not ever discover later. And so the players can either think of them as just like random world building or as actual connections to things. But it's going to be entirely, almost entirely up to the players. Puzzling clues with GM explanations for each of these puzzling clues. This is a great way of doing it, I think. Now you have encounter descriptions and the random encounter tables for, now again, this is one of those examples. There are different tables for round towers and square towers. <laughs> That's the sort of uh, particularity you're looking at with some of these tables and, and some of the, I would say, less agile functionality. On the other hand, that means that this place will not get routine or boring. And that is, I think, a a danger that is worth overcoming. If you're going to run a Mega Dungeon, you're going to have to put in some work anyway. The dangers of Mega Dungeons, as far as I can tell, once you've actually gotten them running, is not giving yourself a little bit more work to do in the prep stage. It's, it's making it boring for the players once they start to play. Right, this is my problem with something like Barrow Maze, which I love. Don't get me wrong. I love Barrow Maze by Greg Gillespie. I've had a ton of fun running it. But very quickly, my players are like, oh, well, yeah, it's the same thing. It's going to be more undead. It's going to be more Barrow it's going to be more barrow, you know, <laughs> fields. It's going to be more tombs. It's going to be more burial alcoves. Yeah, it's the same thing. And very quickly, it can get boring. Part of that is because there's not a ton of interactability with role playing and things like that. Although you can do, you can add a lot more with the, with the uh, rival adventuring parties. But man, this dungeon has been designed so that the players will not get bored. That one fact makes this. Mega Dungeon better than basically any Mega Dungeon that I've seen other than this. <laughs> because the danger of Mega Dungeons, in my experience, except for maybe Castles and Tillin, but that's on the very, very short end of Mega Dungeons. I mean, it's only it's 300 rooms, but it's only 300 rooms compared to this, which is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, really, you're talking about, right? Massively bigger than, than Castles and Tillin. If you're talking about Mega Dungeons, the, the problem is going to be boredom. The sameness of it. It's just going to get routine. Same old, same old. And I think that's even true about the shorter Mega Dungeons. Um, even, again, things like the, the Gillespie Mega Dungeons, which, again, I'm a huge fan of. One of the dangers of them is that it's going to get boring. We're going to want to do a new kind of campaign, right? That's not the case here. Because there's so much variety, there's so much stuff to do, it's just not going to be the case that you're going to run into, I think, that sense of boredom. There's so many different places to investigate, and they all have different vibes, and there's so much role-playing that's going on in them. There's so many different quests that you can take up. If you wanted to spend time in the valley and start to investigate that sort of thing, you can do it. Um, it's a world centered around a particular location, but it's a world. And that is just a, a different way of thinking about Mega Dungeons, rather than a series of rooms with weird creatures in each one much more much more fun much cooler and, and i have to say again when i started this off when i started off reading this i was like man am i really and this is just going to be a you know one of those vanity projects it's going to be one of those things that's kind of like and yet another room full of kobolds and yet another room full of ogres and yet another room full of no way it was not that and that is really really cool so my expectations really, I think, <laughs> contributed to the sense of wonder I have of this thing, because I was expecting something very different than what it actually ended up being. Now, at this point, I've been going for at least an hour, maybe almost an hour. I don't know. It's It's been kind of crazy. And I'm only 107 pages in. So I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here in this video and maybe do a part two. If you guys are interested, if anyone wants it, <laughs> I'll do a part two where I go through particular floors and comment on the design of them and creatures and encounters and things like that. But I I really just wanted to do that overview of the kind of preamble stuff, 
the big picture stuff, talking about the way the dungeon is designed and my thoughts on it, my expectations of it. I mean, again, I, this is not a deep dive in terms of how to run it because I haven't run it. I don't have those that sort of uh, expertise. But as a sort of goodness, I, I've been wanting to make a video about Ardenvol for a while now because it's just so cool. And I hope you guys find it cool too. So anyway, I'm going to stop the video here. And again, maybe at some point I'll do a part two where I go through the individual levels and talk about how they connect and talk about design and cool ideas in there. If you guys think that would be fun. Otherwise, hope this has been interesting to you and I'll see you all in another video.